Hello, and welcome to The Art of Being Human. As we continue this series on drugs, I want to tell you how the drugs are related to each other. All of the major drugs, they come from each other, and so there's a relationship between them. And so I kind of want to start off this time and kind of review this for you. For example, Opium comes from the opium poppy. It's highly addictive, it's a narcotic, it kills pain, it dulls the senses, it gives euphoria and sleeplessness, but it also, when you get too much, gives coma and death. It is a very highly addictive, very dangerous drug. Now, morphine comes from opium. I have some concerns about morphine because they do give it to people who are dying. I remember when my mother was dying and we were all around her bedside, she suddenly put her hand, she wasn't talking, she was like comatose, and she put her hand to her head. That's all she did. And they rushed in with more morphine to give to her because they decided that she must be in pain with no way to tell people that she was in pain. But dying can be a painful process as your body is shutting down. So she did this move movement, and the next thing I knew, they were injecting her with morphine. I have two concerns about morphine and the effects it has on the body. For one thing, People have said that when, if they don't die, it's assumed they will die, and they give them morphine injections to keep them comatose so that they won't feel pain. At least that's the idea of doing it. But if they survive it, they talk about the horrendous, horrible nightmares they had under morphine. People chasing them, beings chasing them, just ugly, awful, dangerous, uh, very, very frightening, uh, frightening kinds of nightmares that they have while they're on morphine. And they can remember them when they wake up. And if they survive, they can tell people how bad they were. So how much morphine should a person have? The other thing about morphine is in some patients, it causes a tremendous itching. I had some morphine after I had a, a medical procedure. And I was supposed to lay in bed for like six hours and not move. Do you know how difficult that is? It's almost a form of torture. You're laying on your back. You're not supposed to turn over. You're not supposed to move at all. For that particular procedure, you're supposed to lay there flat for about six hours while my sister was with me. And it causes a lot of muscle cramping and a lot of discomfort. And I was having back aches. And I knew all I needed to do was move to get rid of them because we move all the time. And, uh, but, we weren't, uh, but I wasn't allowed to. So finally, they gave me some morphine, a small amount, just enough, they thought, to kill the pain. Well, about a minute after I took it, I'm scratching myself like everything. You know, I just can't keep my hands off myself. Though, what about a comatose person who's dying and doesn't have a freedom to move at all because they're just not, they're just not conscious enough to move? And what if they get that terrible itch? What did they do? What if my mother had it? She couldn't, like, I couldn't get up and move, but I certainly was scratching myself. And finally, I says, I can't take this. I'd almost rather have the pain. Well, they didn't give me any more of it because I evidently have a reaction to it. But how many people are getting reactions to the things that they are experiencing when they are in the dying process or when they're comatose for other reasons? You know, if they've had a bad accident and they've had a brain injury and it, with a brain injury and they can't talk and they can't move right but they get, get medications to help with the pain I do believe of course if you need medications for pain you need medications for pain but how can they express that this drug is not working for them it may be killing off the pain but it's doing other uncomfortable things those two things concern me about morphine the uh, morphine the itching and well, how people respond when they wake up and talk about the terrible nightmares that they had when they were under it. And I don't know if people, how much people are paying attention to that. To me, it's an issue. Now, heroin comes from morphine. 
And codeine comes also from opium that's found in the opium pea, but it's weaker than morphine. So here's the relationship. Opium poppy gives you opium, but it also gives morphine, and the morphine gives codeine and also heroin. So there's, there is like a relationship, one coming from the other, one coming from the other. They're all interconnected, and they're all connected with opium. The one that is not is cocaine because cocaine comes from cocoa leaves in the, uh, from South America, and it's used as an anesthesia. It gives you a euphoria, but it also gives compulsive effects and psychological effects. So cocaine is kind of in a class by itself, but opium, morphine, codeine, heroin, they're all interrelated from the opium poppy. Then you have marijuana, which comes from a hemp plant, and hashish is a concentrated form of hemp. Then you have nicotine, which is also considered to be a drug. It's naturally found in tobacco. It has no medical use at all, and it's put in pesticides. And uh, it can be poisonous if you have too much of it, and it's very difficult to get off cigarettes. If you're smoking cigarettes, it's very hard to get off. And if you're using electronic cigarettes, you're still getting the nicotine. You're just not getting the, the vapors in the air. I do not have nicotine in them. If it's a regular cigarette, then the, those vapors go in the air and, and nicotine is included in that. I had a friend of mine, I know it's hard to get off smoking, I've never smoked, and I know it's hard to get o over it, but uh, a friend of mine who wanted to quit smoking uh, told me about how she did it. And uh, she made a pact with somebody else, a good friend of hers, who also wanted to quit smoking. And they made a pact one for another. Now, this might not work for everybody, but it worked for them. If one of them smoked a cigarette, they would have to call the other one and tell them, and the other one would also have to smoke the cigarette. And so in order to stop, no, neither one of them wanted to be the cause of somebody else wanted smoking because the other person didn't want to smoke either. So they would think twice before they would take a cigarette because they did not, because if they made the promise, if I smoke, I'll have to tell you, you'll also have to smoke. In deference to each other, not wanting each other to smoke because they were both trying to quit, the way that they quit was they just wouldn't smoke because of the fact that they would cause somebody else who they they cared for to smoke, and they didn't want to do that. Now, I'm not saying it would work for everybody, but it worked for them, and the both of them stopped smoking, and they never smoked again. Now, alcohol is fermented from grain. It has no nutritional value at all, but it is classed as a food. The reason that it's classed as a food is that it has calories. If you drink uh, drinking uh, alcohol gives you some calories, and uh, it doesn't really digest. It doesn't add to anything. It has no value in terms of the body, but it does have calories in it, so they do class it as a food. That's alcohol. Well, what about caffeine? And I've mentioned caffeine before. It's a natural substance that found, is found in coffee, tea, chocolate, and I believe it's added, and there are probably a whole lot of other things, but it is a natural substance. It's put in colas, and it's put in foods and beverages. And the reason uh, that it's there, uh, that it's added, is that it gives you an extra jolt. It gives you an extra uh, boost, and so a lot of people will drink it. How, how many people can't get by without their cup of coffee in the morning? You know, sometimes I can go day, I like coffee and I do drink it occasionally, but I, I can go days without drinking it and not even feel any effects. Now, there used to be a product, I'm assuming it's still on the market, but I don't know for sure, and that's no dose. And when I was going through college, a lot of people, before they had exams, would take no dose and it would keep them awake. It had kept them jittery enough that it would keep them awake all night so they could study for their exams. I never waited 
to study for an exam. I started studying the materials that were taught in a class the first day I was in the class. So I would be studying all along. So by the time the test came, I was just going to review what I already knew, and that was enough for me. But for students who didn't really do any studying until before a test, they were in a panic. They had to learn all this material, whatever the class was, and then they had to be ready to take the exam. It's a poor way to learn because after you've taken the exam, you're going to forget all that you crammed in. It's not going to stay with you. If you study it and review as you go along, then it's going to stay with you. So that's the best way to study. And they would stay up all night to type papers. If I knew a paper was due, I started sometimes as much as six weeks early to write a paper. I had the paper all done, all typed up. When it was due, it was due. I had it done. Some people would sit up all night trying to type a paper that was due because they hadn't done it, even though they knew it was due, even though they knew, even though they knew what the subject matter was and what they were supposed to write about. They did it all at the last minute. I don't think that if you try to do things at the last minute, it's good for a student. But what they did was they took the snow does to keep them awake so that they would be able to finish their projects on time. As I say, it's a poor way to learn and nothing's going to stay with you. But I was a person and I took it once just to see if it would do that for me. And it never did. No dose had no effect on me at all. And I just did it as an experiment just to see if it would keep me awake. It didn't. So it does, didn't work for everybody, evidently, and I never needed it anyway. As I t said, uh, being a college student, I just experimented with a no dose to see if it would keep me awake, but it didn't do it. But caffeine can keep you awake, and caffeine can make you very jittery. And coffee has anywhere from 100 to 200 milligrams per cup, depending upon the strength of the coffee and uh, how big a cup it is and all of that. And it's considered that 400 milligrams of caffeine or below is safe. But you're going to get very jittery and it's going to have effects on you above that 400 limit. But if you're a coffee drinker and you drink coffee frequently or you're a cola uh, a person and you drink colas frequently, uh, you're going to you're going to go above that 400 milligrams. It's not hard to get above it. Then you kind of get jittery and you don't feel good and you're agitated and you you need to sleep but you can't sleep if it has that kind of effect on you. Uh, caffeine is something that's hard to get away from because it's everywhere. It's not like you're hunting it down really unless you're a student and you just have to keep going and you you know an extra cup of coffee will help you to study for a couple hours longer or whatever, but it, it's everywhere, so it's hard not to do it, hard not to take it in. Now, methadone is a synthetic narcotic drug, and methadone is kind of in a class by itself. It has less withdrawal symptoms. It's used to take people off from drugs. It is itself a narcotic, and you can become addicted to it. But it doesn't have the withdrawal symptoms that other drugs have, and it prevents you, once you're taking it, from wanting other drugs. So it helps people stop using the heroin, whatever they're on, and it helps them just to kick the habit. But it is ad addictive, and you, this, but the symptoms um, are, are less profound uh, but than heroin or morphine. So it's used as a drug to help people get off from drugs, even though itself is a drug. There are different uh, types of drugs that they use now uh, in order to help people off drug. Now, at first, the progression of alcohol and drug addiction is this, and this is kind of a review because I've talked about it before, but you need to understand that at first, the drug, when the drug is taken, it's taken because either a person is trying to self-medicate or they're experimenting with it or it can be taken accidentally, but when it's first taken, the person feels better, a lot better. They have a sense of well-being, and that well-being is important for them, and that is addictive in itself, psychological addiction. They want that feeling of well-being. Everything's all right. Everything's good, you know, and so give me more of it. Now, after us, uh, when they get off the drug, 
and they get back to normal, they see no change in themselves. They see, oh, this is all right. I got kind of a brief respite from what my tensions were. I felt good at the time. Now I'm back to normal. And for all practical purposes, it seems like they're normal. But what they tend to do is to keep taking the drug. They keep taking it because they want that well-being and they want to, it's very addictive and they want to feel good. So they take it and they find out that they have to take a little more and a little more and a little more. And then they start needing it more. And then they start depending upon it more. Part of drug addiction is the fact that you can get dependent on the drug that you're taking. Even if it's not doing anything for you, you want it, you depend upon it. So there's a tolerance. Your body can take more and more and more and tolerate it as well as a dependence. So you have the psychological factors of having the dependence on the drug and the tolerance for the drug going on at the same time. And it's all playing into the fact that you feel so much better when you take it. So why not take it? That's what you're going to be thinking. So I need a little more. I'll take a little more. But that little more stretches out to be more and more and more and more. And and finally, uh, it, you don't feel good if you don't have the drug. If the drug is not in your system, you're not feeling good. And so therefore, you want to take more and more and more. I had an experience with something called Darvon Comp. I don't even know if they're making it. It's a painkiller. And it, I reacted to it, and I felt terrific. I took the pill. This was all under medical supervision. I took it because I had, was prescribed it for pain, and I felt wonderful. Oh, life was just good. I couldn't have had a better life. And it was it, like an, a surreal, unreal world. I knew everything that was going on around me. I could do anything I wanted to do, but I felt so really good in doing it. And I thought, this is an odd reaction to a drug. And then I t tried it two more times just to see if I got the same reaction, and I did. I felt so terrific. I started, boy, this is terrific. I ought to have more of this. And then I realized, of course, this is a dangerous path. I threw it out, and I never had another one. And of course, I never got addicted because I realized that that particular drug affected my system and put me in some kind of a euphoric uh, a feeling, you know, I, I was in contact with reality, I wasn't having hallucinations, this was all legitimate, it was a prescription that a doctor gave me, but my particular reaction to it was to feel too good. Not natural, but too good. And I realized that, that after I took the second pill, that that's the way it was going to be. This wasn't an aberration, this is the way that my body was reacting to it. So I tossed it out, that was the end of that, and I never had any more. I had the wisdom to know that once you start down that road, it's hard to get off from that road. I wasn't going down that road. I had a lot of good things going for me. I had a professional position. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to uh, use drugs because it made me feel good. That would be a wrong thing to do because once you do that, it, you, it keeps going and going and going. And I wasn't going to participate in anything like that. It was too dangerous. It wasn't right. It wasn't good for my system. I happened to get a reaction for that drug in that way. Now, uh, 10 other people, 100 other people could take that same pain medication and not have that result. They would just get the relief of pain that they needed with nothing else. But something happened with my system in which it put me uh, feeling too good and unnaturally good. And I knew that was a danger signal, and I just got rid of it. I would never use it again. So I've never been hooked on a drug. If a drug affects me uh, in such a way that I don't think it's, it's healthy, I won't take the drug no matter what. And I've kept myself safe that way, and I've never been hooked on drugs, and I've never been an alcoholic, and I've never done anything with drugs or alcoholism. I've never drunk a, a, drunk a, a alcohol at all. Even at weddings when they give you the little wine thing that people have, I won't even drink that. 
So you have to keep yourself safe, and you have to use your brain, and you have to realize that once something changes you and it feels good, does not mean it's good for you. There is no such thing as a safe drug. Even aspirin can be dangerous if you get too much of it. And aspirin is a very good drug. It helps many, many people in many kinds of ways. So if you just do, you kind of do what I, uh, use me as an example if you need to. If you're taking a drug and it makes, and it changes you in some way, and you like the change, that does not mean that the drug is safe to take. You may want more and more of it because it makes you feel good without realizing that you could end up by being hooked on that drug. So if you're taking a drug and it doesn't seem quite right to you or it doesn't seem quite real to you or you're having some kind of an experience with a drug that you don't understand or it doesn't seem good, you should, if it's a medicinal drug, you should talk to your doctor. They say don't get off a drug without talking to your doctor if he's prescribed it. They might be able to prescribe something else or a different dosage, but you definitely should not be taking a drug that does something to change your mind, whether good or not, to change your mind and change the way you're thinking. The only drugs that have the right to do that are psychiatric drugs that are under careful scrutiny uh, 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 prescribed by a psychiatrist for patients who are mentally ill who need to have a balance in their body chemistry to stop the symptoms of the mental illness. And that's a special class of psychiatric drugs that are given by people that are very well trained in how to change the system so the person can live a normal life. You can't live a normal life if you're delusional or if you're having uh, auditory uh, hallucinations or visual hallucinations or other kinds of symptoms. Your system needs to be brought into balance and the psychiatric drugs can do that. And they're very helpful to people who need them, but always under the supervision of a person who's specially trained to give them. Other drugs, if you take them and they're making a change in you, whether good or not, you need to be off the drug. If it's a prescription, you need to talk to your doctor about it because no doctor wants to give a drug that is going to harm a patient. So I'm going to close it here. We'll continue with this next time. Please join me then.